If you had asked someone in 2010, a few weeks after Final Fantasy XIII released, if Square Enix was going to turn that entry into a trilogy, I think you'd be pretty hard-pressed to find someone who thinks they would have. XIII's reception was so controversial, you wouldn't think that they'd drag that number along for half a decade. That, and historically, Final Fantasy games usually get one sequel, at most. Unless your name is Final Fantasy VII, then they'll just throw half a dozen things at the wall to see what sticks. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think people who hit credits in Final Fantasy XIII back during release saw Lightning Returns coming, but that's the world we live in, I guess. Now, I played XIII and XIII 2 back when they dropped, but I fell off and gave Lightning Returns a hard pass, which means unlike the last two videos, I was entering completely uncharted waters here. And I think it's the same story for a lot of you out there as well. If my googling and basic math skills are correct, which, to be fair, they usually aren't, Final Fantasy XIII sold about 7.4 million copies in its lifetime. Compare that with Lightning Returns, which sold a cool 1.2 million at best. This means about 1 out of 7 people followed these games the whole way through, if you account for the few madmen who jumped into Lightning Returns first. Yeah, not a lot of people wanted to stick around for the entire 13 trilogy, and I can't really say I blame them. But as for me, coming fresh off the last two games, I had to know, especially given the third game's reputation. Everyone knows about 13 and 13-2's frosty reception, but here's the thing. I think removed from the context of their release, those games are pretty good, if not without their flaws. For Lightning Returns, well, let's just say I haven't read many positive things about it over the years. Before I went into it, I figured it was going to be one of two things. Fire trash, or a trash fire. But expectations are a crazy thing, and sometimes a game can end up completely different from what you'd expect. So now that I've completed it, how did Lightning Returns fare? Uh, in my script here I just wrote asterisk, awkward laughter, so uh, ooh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Like usual, I'll give you your endgame spoiler warning near the end, so with all that said, we've come a long way together. Let's get into the final game in the 13 trilogy. Similarly to 13-2, Lightning Returns throws you right into a conflict you have no context for in its intro cutscene. I've said it before, and I ain't afraid to say it a thousand more times, Square Enix's CG cutscenes were top of the industry at this time, and it still looks great. This girl literally gets dragged into the Shadow Realm by this wall and retreated to a really cool fight scene between Lightning and Snow. The latter going from the face of the Sigma grind set in 13.2 to a super influencer who holds mansion parties. Considering between the last video where I started that joke and now, Snow's voice actor started sniffing that NFT glue, I'm gonna say I called it. Whatever it is. Their fight is interrupted by some girl who looks suspiciously like Sarah, named Lumina, and with that, you get thrown into the tutorial level. You run around Snow's LA penthouse fighting monsters, while Hope, who's been returned to his 13 child form, dumps story <laughs> context at you through a calm conversation. You know, like every game used to do in the early to mid 2010s. At least in this game, Lightning doesn't walk slowly and put her hand to her ear every time they happen. I mentioned in the last video that in the later stages of the PS3 360 generation, there was a lot of pushback against long drawn out cutscenes, especially when starting a new game. Developers were putting an emphasis on finding new ways to convey story to a player without taking control away from them. While characters would occasionally quip at each other outside a battle in 13 and 13-2, most of the context to what you're doing in Lightning Returns is told to you by Hope as you walk around the world, especially in this tutorial level. Does that mean Lightning Returns doesn't have a ton of long drawn out cutscenes? Nah, it's still got a ton of those, but you can see how Square Enix put a lot of emphasis on keeping up with the hashtag current trends around this time, which can be both a good and a bad thing. Back to the tutorial, we fight a dragon boss, then find out we can't progress any further, so Lightning retreats to meet back up with Hope on the Ark, where the player can get a full context for what's going on here. The Ark is Bunivelza from the end of 13-2, the name Hope gave to the artificial cocoon humanity launched T-30 seconds before the world came to an end. It's been repurposed as a base of operations for Hope and Lightning to use while they carry out their mission. What is their mission, you ask? Well, in case you haven't noticed, the world's, uh, pretty done for. The game takes place 500 years after the ending of 13-2, and ever since then, time has come to a complete standstill. People can die, but they no longer age, and children can no longer be born, meaning humanity is slowly dying out. Lightning wakes up from her crystal stasis 13 days before the end of the world, and is given a special mission. Yeah, you think they really like that number, or what? You see, Bunivelza, the, uh, actual in-universe deity Bunivelza, not the Death Star Bunivelza, and I'm just gonna refer to him as God from now on, since that's what the game does anyway, and saying Bunivelza over and over again is gonna get tiring real quick. He's thrown his hands up and basically said, world's fucked, can't fix it. 
Instead, he's gonna go create a new world, so he appoints Lightning as the savior to go around and collect souls to populate it, and he uses Sarah's soul as a bargaining chip. And this is pretty much what you'll be doing throughout all Lightning Returns. You explore the shrinking world of Nova Crystallia, collecting major souls by completing the main quests, and minor souls through the side quests. It's here where my normal video structure is thrown into a bit of a loop. Normally, I'd talk about the gameplay first and explain the structure later, but for Lightning Returns, the way the game is structured is so integral to everything else the game does, I pretty much have to talk about it first. The way the game is structured is so infamous, even if you're watching this video and you haven't played the game, you probably know exactly what I'm about to say next. The game takes place 13 days before the end of the world, and that isn't just an arbitrary statement. You have a fixed time limit of 13 in-game days to complete the game. As you go about doing quests, the clock is constantly ticking down, with each in-game day lasting about an hour. At the end of each day, Lightning is forced back to the Ark to see a few cutscenes before getting another go at it. And in case you're wondering, no, she apparently doesn't need to sleep. Maximum productivity. If the 13 days run out and you haven't finished everything, it boots you back to the beginning and loops into New Game Plus. So much of this game revolves around this time mechanic and the way it interacts with the game's other mechanics. You see, Lightning Returns is all about doing quests. Given that finishing the game and unlocking the final day requires you to beat each of the five main quests and about 40 or so side quests, you don't have the luxury to look at the ground and stare at your shoes for 15 minutes. You gotta go. You gotta plan out how you're gonna spend your days beforehand in order to waste as little time as possible, like Lightning has been watching Hustle Culture YouTube videos non-stop during her 500 year crystal sleep. However, it's not gonna be as simple as just going to an area and doing every quest in your log as soon as you get them. The game consists of four small hub worlds where these main and side quests take place. They're the city Luxarion, the, uh, other city, Yusnan, the Wildlands, a pulse-style big open area, and the Dead Dunes, another decent-sized open area. Each area has a directed focus and a few traits that are unique to that area, so they all have their own sense of individuality. Luxarion and Yusnan are about the size of a standard 13-2 map. The Wildlands is about the size of the Arkilt Step from 13, and the Dead Dunes is about half the size of that. Since the size and openness of maps is a hot topic in the Final Fantasy XIII series, I'd say they're all decently non-linear and have a bunch of ways to move around them. However, this doesn't really matter, since Lightning Returns is about as non-linear as you can get. Other than certain quests requiring you to finish others before they unlock, even the main quests can be done in any order you choose. We're about as far away from 13's hallways as we can get at this point. The time mechanic also has an impact on these maps in a few different ways. Certain areas within these worlds, particularly Luxarion, only open up at certain times of day. Certain quests only appear after a few days have elapsed, and etc. Unlike in the other games where doing battles and leveling up is your main way to grow stronger, in Lightning Returns you gain fixed stat boosts by completing main and side quests. That means, to be able to challenge certain main story bosses, you're gonna have to take some time out to clear up some side quests and get stronger before you stand a chance. Don't take too long though, while you do have 13 days total, technically 14, but we'll get into that later, you only start off with 7, with the rest being unlocked after clearing certain story requirements. As you play through Lightning Returns, you live and die by this time mechanic. It's always on your mind. Time is a resource, and everything costs time. Walking around takes time, traveling to different areas by trains that run on a set schedule takes time. If you run or die in a battle, you lose an hour of in-game time, and you really feel it. You can spend a resource called EP on an ability called Chronostasis, which will stop time for about one minute. But there's a lot of stuff that you might need to spend that EP on, which we'll talk about later, so choosing to do so is another resource you have to manage. Taking a lot of time on a difficult side quest means less time you can spend on other quests. Going down a long hallway just to find out there was nothing for you on the other side isn't just frustrating because you wasted your real-life human time, but your in-game time as well. It's a mechanic that works around stress, which is to say it's definitely a controversial mechanic. I can see it driving a lot of people away from the game instantly just with its inclusion. I'd say people are likely split into three categories on this one. Column A are people who completely hate this mechanic and are turned off by its inclusion. Column B are people who are indifferent, or are at least able to ignore the time mechanic as much as they can and just play through the game as if it wasn't there. And column C are people who enjoy the mechanic and like the sense of pressure it brings. Now, I haven't done a peer-reviewed study on the subject, but I'd say columns A and B are far larger than C, which means Square Enix had to know that they were taking a big risk by putting it into their latest big-budget Final Fantasy game. 
Before I continue forward, I have to tell you a story. A story about me. It's relevant, I promise. There was a different game with a time mechanic that I wanted to play for pretty much half of my entire life, but I was always intimidated by it. I knew so many people who loved the game, and they'd always tell me how great it was and how I should just play it, but I can never bring myself to do it. I bought a nice pristine boxed copy of it in 2019, and it just sat there on my shelf, daring me to play it. The thing is, logically, I knew I had no reason to be this scared of playing the damn game. It didn't have a reputation for being hard, and I'd like to think I'm pretty good at video games, there was just this illogical hurdle between me and the time mechanic. I always kept thinking how messing up a few times in a row could totally screw over my entire playthrough. However, while playing through Final Fantasy XIII last year to make that video, I knew I'd eventually have to confront Lightning Returns as well. So, I put on my big boy pants, pulled the game off my shelf, pushed past all my mental barricades, and finally got around to playing Pikmin. And you know what? It was great. One of my favorite Nintendo IPs, hands down. This is all a roundabout way of saying, I am not that guy in column C. Time mechanics are not something I look forward to in games, and I was definitely not looking forward to contending with it in Lightning Returns. All of that, and I mean all of that, being said, after playing both Pikmin and Lightning Returns, I kind of get it. One thing you gotta know is that Lightning Returns is a bit difficult. I'm not trying to end up in an It's Like Dark Souls tweet, but it's extremely likely that if you play on normal difficulty, you will end up not being strong enough to complete your objectives in time and will have to loop. This feels like it was intended for normal difficulty, and easy difficulty is meant for people who just want to get it all over with in one go. If you play on normal, you'll probably fail and start again on New Game Plus, where you bring all your stat gains and items over. The reason I say I feel like this was intended is because there are certain mechanics that don't even unlock until you game over it and reset the timeline. For example, the spell level up system. While this might sound like a nightmare, once I accepted I probably wasn't going to get strong enough in one playthrough and intentionally hit the loop by wasting time at the end until the world ended, I started to find some enjoyment you can only get with this time mechanic. On my new playthrough, I knew exactly where I had to be for all the quests I'd already completed, which areas the quests would take me to, and how long I would have to do each. I became a well-oiled machine, taking down quests with ruthless efficiency. I did two main quests and about a dozen side quests before I decided to take the L in game over so I could start again on New Game Plus, something that took about five in-game days the first go-around. On my second time through, I had it all done in two days, and the first day is a half day. There's a certain sense of accomplishment in planning out the perfect day and executing it. It's kind of like speedrunning, but you don't actually have to be good. I'm still not a fan of time mechanics in general, but I appreciate the fact that the reason most of this stuff works is because it's timed. If you had infinite time to just do whatever you wanted at your leisure, there'd be no incentive to optimize your day, and the cracks with the game's side quests would start to show even more than they do. What are the cracks, you might ask? Well, the side quests are kinda bad. Like, all of them. Out of the 60 or so side quests I did during my time with the game, I'd say like, four had me invested in what was going on, and even those didn't end with any kind of satisfaction. Don't expect them to contain anything of substance gameplay-wise either. They're all, go here, do thing, maybe kill monster, come back, get reward. I did the side quests because they're practically mandatory to unlock the final day and get the true ending, and getting stat boosts from them makes my brain hit me with the feel-good chemical. But nothing about the side quests themselves actually made me want to do them, you know what I mean. It was fun for a while, especially when I was still in awe about how much time I saved compared to my first go-around, but eventually, the novelty wore off. I'd talk to the NPC, listen to their benign issue, go to do their thing, come back, watch their soul fly into lightning, confetti. Rinse and repeat, like, 50 plus times. And, uh, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. The time limit Lightning Returns gives you is really, really generous. By day 7, I'd already pretty much cleared up everything I needed to do, and none of my days were anywhere near as efficient as my first two. Look, I'm no super gamer, and I'm sure for some people, their playthrough had them cutting it really close to the wire. I'm just pretty confident that for the average playthrough, you're probably only gonna need about half the time you're given. I could just take my time doing these few remaining side quests I wasn't even all that interested in. Without the time pressure, it was just mindless busy work. Sure, a few more unlocked as the days went on and I completed more main quests, but I still spent the majority of my final days resting at the end to kill time. I did feel a little sense of dread when my final hours were running up. I knew I had done everything I needed to do, but there's a certain feeling you get when you know there's no going back. Your time is up. It got me anxious, in a good way. 
So, all in all, I do get what they were going for with this time mechanic thing. It works in theory, and it did work for me, at least for a little bit, but eventually, it totally fell apart. I can't just say they should have removed it, because the way the entire game works is based around it. It's central to every mechanic I mentioned and will mention later in the video. The solution also isn't as simple as just giving the player less time, or more quests to do. If they were this committed to the system, it needed a deep overhaul and some serious rebalancing. Something they probably couldn't do because like 13-2, Lightning Returns was shoved out the door with a development time of just a year and a half. That's an insanely short time for a AAA game, a really insanely short time for a AAA RPG, and a really, really insanely short time for a AAA RPG that was mechanically very different from its predecessors. They had time to design and implement the system, sure, but fine-tuning it is a process that needed a lot more time in playtesting. That's a step you gotta skip if you're planning to churn the game out in record time. Now, I just want to clarify here. I say that I feel like you have too much time, but I also mentioned that I was able to save a lot of time because I had prior knowledge from my first playthrough. Even though that first playthrough was only about six hours of content. I just want to make clear that while it definitely feels like the intended experience from the developers is to have the player interact with New Game Plus before they beat the game, it definitely isn't impossible to clear the game on normal without doing New Game Plus. The question then becomes, would you still have too much time even if you did the whole game on normal in one playthrough? Well, I can only speak from my experience, and I can't just delete my memories of the game to go find out. Looking this question up online, however, it seems that many people who didn't loop still found the game gave you too much time. New Game Plus or not, the general consensus is that Lightning Returns' time limit only works on you so long as you don't have an understanding of what you have left to do. Once the full scope of the game becomes apparent about a third in, you can just stick a piece of tape on your screen over the clock. It doesn't matter anymore. Now that we know how the time mechanics work, it's time to talk about the gameplay. You might be wondering how exactly the battle system works in Lightning Returns, given that you only have one party member. I was wondering the same as well. There's never been a mainline Final Fantasy game where you primarily play as a single character for an extended period of time. So here's how it goes. First off, throw away everything you know about Final Fantasy battle systems, especially the 13 series. Get that auto battle shit out of here. In Lightning Returns, you assign skills to the four face buttons on the controller. You have standard skills like attack and guard, tons of different types of magic, there's a lot to choose from. You could go wild and assign an attack skill to all four, but let's assume you assigned attack, guard, and maybe a spell or two. You then hold the button that corresponds to each skill to activate it. This means, rather than giving orders your character acts out like in previous 13 games, this time you directly control lightning with the four face buttons. You can even move lightning around directly in this game. Well, sorta. When I heard this was a feature in Lightning Returns, I got really excited, since I kept having PTSD flashbacks to my characters in the last two games auto-dashing into AoE attacks. Yeah, turns out when the game says you can move lightning around with a control stick, it means you can do this little shuffle. It's something, I guess. Each time you use a skill, it costs a little bit of ATB, which regenerates slightly whenever you're not doing an action. Sounds simple enough, right? But you might be saying to yourself, four skills seems a bit limited considering you only play as a single character. And that's true, but that's where the game's main mechanic, the schema system, comes into play. I made a joke in my last two videos that Matomo Toriyama, the director of 10 13, and 13 seemed to have a real thing for women changing clothes. Well, someone let the beast out of his cage for Lightning Returns, because my dude isn't holding anything back here. Side note, Toriyama also directed 7 Remake, and would you look at that, Tifa and Aerith have far more dress options in that game than they did in the original. This man cannot be stopped. The way it works is, you can assign three different costumes, known as garbs, to lightning that she can use during battle. Each garb has different strengths and weaknesses. Some might be good at magic, others might be good for physical attack and defense, standard stuff. Each of these garbs usually comes with a skill or two locked in, but the rest are freely chosen by the player. There are a lot, and I mean a lot of garbs in this game. Me hand counting the list on the wiki says there's over 90, including DLC. They're not all same costume but yellow either, there's a huge variety of different styles and looks. Not all of them are what I'd call in character for Lightning. For example, the Mikote Catgirl suit, but this is a dream come true for anyone who likes costumes in games, especially ones that have an effect on gameplay. I mean, just look at all these. Samurai Lightning? Shit, that's all you had to say. And who could forget the Tomb Raider costume? You know how you can carbon date a fossil? 
Yeah, in 10,000 years, I'll be able to carbon date the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy based on their crossover costumes. Once you've selected your three garbs, you can switch between them during battle with R1 or L1, and each garb has its own ATB gauge that'll fill up when you're not using it, meaning when you run out for one, you can just switch to the next to keep going. This means you're usually always on the go with something to do. There's not a lot of downtime where you're just sitting there waiting for your ATB bar to refill. It's also not completely true to say that Lightning is solo for the entire game. You get a consistent Chocobo companion for the Wildlands map, and Fang joins you for a good portion of the desert. But for the most part, it's just you and the three or so enemies on the other side of the screen. In truth, I've gotta say, I really like Lightning Returns' battle system. It feels great to play, and even better to master. Your individual skill as a player absolutely has a huge impact on the outcome of a battle. You learn to master the attack patterns of different enemies and how to stagger them. Staggering in Lightning Returns is kinda straightforward, but unlike 13, 13, 2, and 7 Remake, you're not given a concrete number. Instead, you have this heart rate monitor looking thing that'll pulse bigger if you're using the right attacks. It works most of the time, but sometimes you'll be beating an enemy over the head with their weakness and they won't budge. Thankfully, that's not your only option here. If you press block a few frames before an enemy attack hits, you'll parry it, negating most, if not all, of the damage and racking up stagger meter on certain enemies. That's usually all I need to hear. I'm a big sucker for parry slash time dodge mechanics in games. With these systems, you can feel your skill improving as a player and how that affects your battle performance. Not to, you know, fillet myself, but peep this right here. I'm fighting these two enemies called Anubises. I've fought them so many times, I can count off the time their attack animation takes from startup almost by heart, and I have no problem pairing them into submission, and it just feels really satisfying to pull off. With its new focus on combat, Lightning Returns almost feels like a character action game. Don't run too far with that statement, it's not that complex, this isn't Bayonetta or anything. But your skill as a player generally has just as much say on the outcome of a battle as your stats do. The camera is really close to lightning as well, meaning there's a good amount of readability for a given situation. You're always pretty well shown exactly what's going on. That's not to say all enemies are created equal. This is technically an RPG first, after all. Some of them have really frustrating ways of attacking you and you just have to sit there and deal with it, but I was enjoying this battle system more than I was not. It's not crazy deep, but it'd be disingenuous to call it deathless. They would actually get the idea for the battle system by asking the Final Fantasy vs. XIII team for a few pointers. Vs. XIII would undergo a few more changes on its way to becoming 15 that differentiate the battle system from the prototype they probably grabbed as inspiration for Lightning Returns, but if I squint, I can kinda see it. Especially with the holding down the button to attack stuff. You'd think that with this increased focus on player input when compared to the last two games, the ranking system would have a chance to make its return better than ever. Now that combat is more action-focused, it could account for more than just time spent in battle. Combos, attack variety, it'd probably feel a lot less out of place in Lightning Returns than in the last two games. Well, in a move that's honestly more confusing than anything, it's been gutted almost entirely. It still shows up after you beat a boss, and to its credit, it does have a formula this time that takes into account your HP, the items you use, and a few other things, but you'll be seeing it a total of like, six times in a playthrough. You don't get anything for scoring well during a fight either, it's just an approximation of how well you did, so once again, feel free to ignore it pretty much completely. Now in Lightning Returns, you have micro and macro decisions. We've already covered the micro, the decisions you make in battle to win, keep yourself alive, etc. Now let's take a look at the bigger picture, i.e. everything that happens between battles. In Lightning Returns, you don't heal after enemy encounters like in the last two 13 games, assuming you're not playing on easy, and you can only carry around a few healing items at most. This means you're really incentivized to perform well in battle to mitigate the overall damage you receive. When you enter a new area, you don't really know when you'll be able to do a restock, so there's a certain amount of tension you feel as you fight new enemies in unfamiliar territory. Battles have consequences, and remember, dying costs you precious time, which ends up being not so precious in the long run, but, I mean, you still don't want to do it. How you spend your dwindling stock of resources will affect how efficiently you can go about your day. A dungeon crawl you could have done in one go might take two trips if you get careless and waste all your potions 15 minutes in. On the map, battles follow the same semi-random system that 13-2 used. An enemy will morph into existence and you have a chance to get the first swing in. This time, the bonus for a preemptive strike is taking 25 or 10% of the enemy's health out at the beginning of combat, and if you fail, you lose 5% of your total health. One major difference and a huge quality of life upgrade from 13-2, however, is enemies now have to hit you with a swing to start the battle from their end, rather than just touching you. This means you aren't totally screwed anymore if an enemy shows up in a narrow hallway. 
As long as you can avoid the hit, you can avoid the battle completely and keep on going. Now remember, I said before that unlike almost every RPG ever, you don't get EXP for beating enemies in Lightning Returns. The only stat upgrades you get are from doing quests. If that's the case, then what's the point of fighting enemies and doing battles? Is Goblin Genocide cancelled? Why not just avoid every encounter you come across? Well, aside from sometimes needing monster drops to complete side quests, beating enemies gives you that resource I talked about earlier, EP. You can do a lot of stuff with EP. Heal yourself in battle, cure status ailments, use special moves, etc etc, but it can also be used out of battle as well. Outside of combat, it's mostly used for time-saving mechanics, like stopping time for a brief period or teleporting so you don't have to wait for train schedules. This leads to more decisions you have to make to balance this resource along with your others. Sure, you could heal yourself with some EP, but you might need to teleport later, so maybe you should just use a potion. You could fight this strong monster for a lot of EP, but maybe the damage you take in battle will mean it won't be worth it. If you get 2 EP from beating the monster, but you need 2 EP to use a Kuraga after the fight, you've only broken even resource-wise. Not just resource management, your basic math skills are going to get a workout playing this game as well. Of course, this is all assuming you're not playing on easy, which lowers the cost of your EP abilities and recovers your health outside of battle. This all matters because you don't have infinite time to patch up your mistakes. See what I mean when I said the time mechanic literally affects everything you do in this game? And if you're thinking what I'm thinking, you probably see where this is going next. This means that when the time mechanic starts to fall apart, everything else does as well. What happens when time management isn't a factor anymore and you don't really need any EP? Well, you wouldn't really have much of a need for battles anymore, would you? If there's nothing you need from the battle, and you don't get stronger by doing it, then why bother wasting the time? This means that the back half of my playthrough was just running around doing side quests like an Uber Eats delivery man whose bike got stolen but still had a daily quota they need to hit to keep the lights on. Once the time mechanic is stripped away, you realize that Lightning Returns is just a series of fetch quests strung together by a pretty good battle system. Look, I can appreciate that they wanted to shake the formula up and do something different, but maybe there's a reason why the cycle of battling and gaining EXP has worked for pretty much every RPG ever. Even if the combat system is good, which, let me be clear, it is, once you lose your reason to interact with it, every encounter ends up feeling like a roadblock between you and your destination. Character action games keep their combat fun by presenting you with different encounters in different areas that make the way you tackle them different. Lightning Returns has a good combat system, but it's still an RPG first. This means the same encounters aren't changed up in meaningful ways each time you do them. I fought these Flanaders and the guards so many times, I can practically close my eyes, count the amount of blizzards to throw out, switch to fire, physically attack the last one, and battle over. Final Fantasy XIII was pretty heavily criticized for its linearity. I'd say that it's the thing most people think of immediately when that game is brought up. This would result in 13-2 taking actions to move away from the structure that would make its predecessor so infamous. Lightning Returns throws everything out the window and says it doesn't care. Go do whatever you want in whatever order you feel like. 13-2 would sort of dabble with this non-linear storytelling structure, but it didn't seem properly set up to support it. You could do a few events out of order, but it would lead to inconsistencies in character dialogue. In a game all about time paradoxes, no, the irony is not lost on me. Meanwhile, in Lightning Returns, even the main quests can be done completely out of order, if you so choose. But you're pretty heavily railroaded into doing them in order, since trying to tackle Mission 3 before Mission 1 will result in the first enemy turning you into a lightning-shaped smear on a poorly textured wall. With this non-linear approach to its design, you might think that Lightning Returns would have some issues with a consistent difficulty curve. And it does, but not for the reasons you might think. It's more like a difficulty boomerang. Muda, muda. On my first playthrough, I struggled a lot with the bosses of Chapters 1 and 2, Chapter 1 specifically. It was at this point I decided to loop the timeline, and the second time around, despite my increased power, I still found myself having a lot more difficulty beating the first chapter than I thought I should. I was worried I would end up having to loop again, when all of a sudden, the challenge just melted before me. On my second go around at Chapter 1's boss, I only managed to pull off a single star on the battle results. Chapter 3's boss was a bit tough, but I learned the pattern pretty quickly and only died once. Chapter 4's boss was so easy, I didn't even realize it was the finale until after I beat it. Getting 5 stars on that one was practically participation trophy difficulty. There were random encounters in Chapter 2 that posed more of a threat than the second last boss of the game, and I don't mean that as in how strong I was at the time. I mean that as in I could go to the Chapter 2 area and find a random encounter that's more difficult than the Chapter 4 boss, with me having the same stats for both encounters. There was just no consistency. This Earth Eater enemy in the trial area is the hardest encounter in the entire game. 
let's just say, if you know, you know. Outside of battle is pretty much what you'd expect. You run around as lightning, talking to NPCs to complete your quests. It does try to mix in some alternate styles of gameplay outside of overworld exploration and battling, but let's just say it has mixed success. One example that sticks out to me is this early game tailing mission, because, of course, a game from 2013 is a tailing mission. I don't even need to say it, it doesn't work well. The NPCs bug out, Lightning crouches only when she feels like it, I'm just glad it's done once and never again. Also, the QTEs from 13.2 won't be making a comeback. You can see how quickly that gameplay trend fell out of favor. You might have noticed by now that I'm talking about trends a lot in reference to the 13 trilogy. I think for gaming, the early to mid 2010s were defined a lot by these trends that most mainstream titles would rush to adopt. Maybe that's still the case today and it's just easier to see when you've got a few years to look back on it, but let's not worry about that right now. There's concrete stuff like QTEs, tailing missions, online social interaction systems requiring oh no. Facebook integration, which Lightning Returns actually had, by the way. I couldn't make that shit up if I tried. It was shut down a few years after launch because, I mean, who expected that to last, and it was totally gutted from the PC version. There's a lot of subtler stuff as well. The abstract feel of an early 2010s game, if you will. The Final Fantasy series certainly didn't invent the classic RPG formula, but it always felt to me more like a trend setter rather than a trend chaser. 13-2 and more so Lightning Returns do give me that feeling, however. They do have plenty of their own unique ideas, but like I said, the abstract feel of an early 2010s game is pretty present here. Just some food for thought. Anyways, there are shops out and about where you can buy weapons, garbs, skills and the like, but the gill system is kinda weird. Not Final Fantasy XIII gill system kinda weird, but a bit lopsided. You get gill from completing battles, that's a standard, but there are also constantly respawning item pickups around the world that are specifically sold for gill. You know what this says to me? That some late development playtesting revealed that the rate the player earns gill wasn't tuned properly, and doing a full rebalance was gonna take too much time. So instead, just litter the world with a bunch of shinies the player can pick up. That'll give them that dopamine hit, right? They're just scattered around the world with no real in-game explanation. Like, okay, I'll take them, I guess. There's this mechanic where you enter a dark zone with a powered-up monster where you collect dark seeds to sell for, you guessed it, more money. You can also get the occasional item reward, and fun fact, this is also how you get the single elixir that's in the game. It takes a lot of grinding, but I'm all about stocking up on powerful items so useful that it almost seems a waste to actually, you know, use them. The thing with the money system is, I never struggled with gil at all. Most garments and healing items are cheap, spell fusion and upgrading is so cheap it's practically free, and you find plenty of weapons out in the field. Late game, I was just wasting it on items I didn't really need just to have something to do with it. But, you do have one other form of currency you can spend instead of gil, called money. I'm not talking about Kingdom Hearts M-U-N-N-Y, I'm talking about that stuff you have in your wallet right next to you. This game has a lot of DLC costumes, and those DLC costumes don't come cheap. They're anywhere between 3 to 4 US dollars per. Luckily, the PC version comes with 99% of them for free, but you're pretty screwed if you're playing the game on PS3 or an Xbox console through backwards compatibility. Not to mention, the DLC garbs and weapons kinda trivialize the easy game. Square Enix sitting like the demon on your shoulder like, Damn, you seem to be struggling. $3.99 and this could get a whole lot easier for you. I'm a sucker for costumes, but let's just say I wouldn't be paying for them if I wasn't playing on PC. Speaking of tempting players through aesthetic-based microtransactions, I think it's time to go over how Lightning Returns looks. You'd think that because this is the third game in a series that's basically made up of reused assets from the past two games, there wouldn't be much to talk about here. But fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, Lightning Returns never fails to surprise me. Again, Lightning Returns' opening cutscene is immaculate. That totally is a repeat of the last two videos, but what do you want me to say? Square Enix definitely mastered the art of putting their best foot forward with these CG cutscenes. Like 13-2, the amount of them has been dramatically scaled back when compared to the first game, only having one for the opening and the ending. Budget constraints, expedited dev time, there's probably a lot of reasons for that. That said, Your Honor, I must confess that this fight scene between Lightning and Snow is rad as fuck. I'm not gonna question why Lightning can do Dragon Ball Z instant transmission now, but I can't help but admire the animation work. As for the in-game graphics... Uh, okay, so look. Let's just say right off the bat, a lot of character models got reused, so those are gonna all look the same. 
NPC models around the world have been spruced up, so they don't look quite as PS2 as they did in 13.2. They still don't look great, but an improvement is an improvement. Now the new areas... I mean, considering there's only four of them, it's weird to see how poor they are. The texture work is muddy, they look flat and undetailed, Luxarion is definitely the biggest offender for this. Assets for the world weren't lifted as heavily from 13 and Lightning Returns as they were in 13-2, so I appreciate these areas are basically made from scratch. They just go to show the consequences of developing these games in 18 months. The thing about 13-2 was that the completely original levels were some of the best looking ones, not only in terms of visual fidelity, but art style wise as well. Lightning Returns does have a few sub areas that do look nice, but for the most part, it's an objective graphical downgrade. Also, don't think I'm gonna make a Lightning Returns video without talking about the dog. I mean, just look at this thing. I don't know what happened here. The cat model looks fine. I don't know how anyone signed off on a dog model that looks this bad. Especially since it plays a front and center role for like, three side quests. Also, the dog's name is Korone in Japanese. I'm just saying. Korone? Korone nandana? I am a dog. Okay. Now, I get it. It's a nitpick. Why bother giving them this much shit? It's just one bad model of a dog. And you know, normally, I'd agree. If it was just a bad model of a dog, it wouldn't even be worth bringing up. But similarly to the title of my manifesto, it's more than just the dog. You gotta understand, when Final Fantasy XIII came out, it literally set the standards for visuals at the time. You could have made a pretty good argument back then that it was the best looking console game to ever release. Thirteen came out in the early days of the generation as well. Developers hadn't had as much time to learn how to push these systems to their limit to squeeze even more graphical fidelity out of them. In contrast, Lightning Returns came out in the twilight years of the 360 PS3 generation. They had four extra years of knowledge to put to work improving the graphics, and it looks worse than it ever has. This dog is one of the few completely unique models they made for this game, and look at the lack of effort they put into it. Now I'm not naive. The openness of Lightning Returns' maps combined with the NPC's schedules likely eats into the game's performance budget. The Crystal Tools engine wasn't meant to handle stuff like this. So sure, maybe visual design on par with 13's linear levels was out of the question, but so much of Lightning Returns just looks flat out unfinished. Also, I don't know if it's because the PC port is unoptimized or because the engine is fundamentally flawed, but the frame rate dips hard in the city areas. I don't have a super PC, true, but there are a lot of hiccups that shouldn't be happening with a GTX 1070 running a nearly decade old game. Can't imagine how bad it was on the original console hardware. Don't get me wrong, in the grand scheme of things, it's not like this game looks awful. But instead of improving visually as most series do with time, the 13 series went from being one of the best looking games of the generation to below average. The 13 trilogy sat on its laurels visually by crutching off assets they made half a decade ago, and when it was time to make something new, there were noticeable drops in quality. The thing that's got me most up in arms about this is prior to release, Director Toriyama claimed that this was going to be the most polished Final Fantasy game of all time. Yeah, don't know about that one. They were so ahead of the game graphics-wise in 13, but instead of improving, they just sat there while the rest of the industry caught up around them and kept moving forward. Switching to a more positive note, there are some aspects of Lightning Returns' visual design where you can see a lot of detail was put into it. Snow got a visual design update by Tetsuya Nomura, but for the most part, the other characters look exactly like they did in the last two games. Lightning, on the other hand... well, I mean, I did mention how many new costumes she has, right? I can picture the board meeting where they decided to reuse the assets for the other characters to reduce the workload, and right as everyone was filing out, Director Toriyama pulled aside Isamu Kamikokuryo, the art director, and was like, Not you. I'm putting you to work. There's a ton of visual variety in Lightning's costumes, and that's not even counting the adornments you can attach to them. You can even mess with the colors yourself to customize it even further, something I didn't do because I know a total of, like, six colors. These costumes appear in cutscenes as well, so you can tell they carefully modeled them to make sure there wouldn't be any major issues no matter which one yet equipped. Or, at least I assume they did, since I didn't notice any. Actually, looking it up, it seems their main priority was not having Lightning's underwear be exposed in cutscenes no matter what outfit she was wearing. This is- this is actually written here, in like, black and white text. Like, it, I'm not joking, this isn't a joke. I wanna emphasize, I could not make this shit up no matter how much I wanted to. Don't never say the people at Square Enix don't know their priorities. Like, I had it in my script, but just reading it again now... Oh man, I, I need a minute. Like, it's a professional interview, and you're representing a company, why would you... Why would you just tell people that? Even if that's what you were thinking, why would you... Why would you just tell people that? Oh man, I don't get it.
One last piece of extra effort that I greatly appreciated is that a lot of the costumes have unique victory animations at the end of a battle. As far as I can tell, costumes fit into certain archetypes, and each of those archetypes share a unique victory animation. There are a ton of these, I was still discovering new ones late into the game. I'll show you a little montage. This doesn't make up for the lack of polish in other aspects of the visuals, but I like this. It's good. It shows that same attention to detail the first 13 game had is still deep down there somewhere. I'll still stand by the fact that the 13 series had great music. 13 had a nice set of orchestral and piano melodies. 13-2 did a lot of experimenting with genres to have a high-quality, varied soundtrack. Masashi Hamauzu returned to do this OST as well, and before I played it, I wondered how he was gonna top 13-2s. Lightning Returns has a lot of what I guess I'm gonna call vibe music. It's got a lot of tracks where you can just hit the pause button and get a real feel for the area. Each area has a different theme depending on the time of day, and the music does a good job at capturing the mood. A lot of it doesn't necessarily sound like Final Fantasy music, if you know what I mean, but it isn't a bad thing. The theme for Luxarian at night kind of sounds like something out of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Meanwhile, the daytime theme sounds like it's something straight out of Final Fantasy XII. As for battle themes, don't even get me started. There are so many different ones depending on the area and time of day, I couldn't give you an exact number even if I wanted to. Instead, I'm gonna talk about two standouts. The first is the Wildlands battle theme, Savior of Souls. It's the kind of high-energy upbeat tune you want to be the backing track of you taking dudes out. <laughs> The next one is Crimson Blitz, which is actually a pseudo-remake of 13's battle theme, Blinded by Light. Now I've gotta come clean. I've been holding out on ya. There was actually a remix of that tune in 13-2 as well, but I didn't mention it since I couldn't find a way to fit it into the video without forcing it. With Crimson Blitz and Lightning Returns, we have a theme that's kind of evolved as the series has gone on. I think it's a cool progression. I'll play you 30 seconds or so, so I'll let you form your own opinions on it. Now overall, do I think Lightning Returns has the best OST of the trilogy? I'm gonna go with no. I still think that title belongs to 13 too. Now if you're making me choose between OG 13 and Lightning Returns, that's a tough one. I think I go with Lightning Returns, but barely. There are a few duds, but I think similarly to 13 too, it has a wide variety of genres that 13 can't really compete with. Right before we move away from sound design, I've gotta mention this somewhere. Through the entire 13 trilogy, Snow has been voiced by Daisuke Ono, who you might know as the voice of Jotaro Kujo from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Obviously, his Jotaro voice and Snow voice are pretty different, so unless someone outright mentioned it, like I am now, you probably wouldn't make the connection. Well, that is, until Lightning Returns. <laughs> As far as story goes, I'm sure you haven't heard anything good about Lightning Returns before watching this video. Look, it's hard for me to make a judgement call on an entire game's plot. Storytelling is an abstract science, there's no real mathematical formula you can use to tell a good story. We do have a ton of examples of both great and terrible storytelling in fiction, but ultimately, a story will hit different people in different ways. What I'm trying to say is, I wouldn't casually call a game's plot awful, knowing that sometimes, something that may not resonate with me might work for someone else. So, with that being said, oh man is Lightning Returns' plot awful. 
It's shallow, and it just doesn't really go anywhere. The basic premise isn't bad, but the game doesn't do anything with it. I mean, it can't. Cutscenes have to play out at the beginning and end of each day, no matter how much or how little progress you've made in the main quest, so they have to be as removed from that as possible. I'll give you an example. A lot of these cutscenes center around newcomer character Lumina and her relationship with Lightning, but you can immediately notice the problem here. Cutscenes with Lumina usually play out at the beginning and end of each day, but she shows up in the main quests as well. So you run into the issue where the pace of Lightning's relationship with Lumina in the main quests had the potential to go faster or slower than the pace of her relationship with Lumina in the story segments that happen on a fixed basis, or vice versa. This all would have depended on how quickly individual players progress through the story. The developers were definitely aware of this potential issue, so to keep things consistent, they made it so that the cutscenes don't really push anything along, at least not until the end of the game when everything starts coming together. Whenever I think of storytelling in games, I go back to this quote I heard from Bungie back when they were developing the original Halos, where every time they would make a cutscene, they would say to themselves, what's stopping the player from skipping this? I wonder if anyone on the writing team of this particular branch of the Final Fantasy development department had this thought, or did they just have a list of things they wanted to shove in come hell or high water? Now, don't get me wrong, I don't skip cutscenes in games, and I don't whip out my phone every time one starts. If I'm in there, I'm in there, even if I don't like it. Especially when I'm planning to do an hour-long video retrospective about the game. Huge details can be lost with just a few lapses of attention, and I don't think it'd be fair of me to criticize a game I was only half paying attention to. I watched every cutscene the game threw at me, and all I could think during a good portion of them is how much I wish they just weren't happening. So many didn't change or develop anything, they were just there to hold me hostage for 5-10 to 10 minutes. They'd throw things at me and I'd just sit there and go, okay, 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 like a human version of one of those water sipping ducks. Two things can push me to keep playing a game, some good ass gameplay, or a story that sinks its hooks in me. I mean, it's usually a combination of the two. Lightning Returns' gameplay had me for a while, I'd say for about the first third of the game, but there was never a point in the story where I was really all too invested to see what happens next. So, the overall plot is a wash, but what about the individual chapters of the main quest? Each chapter is like its own self-contained story that ties back into the bigger narrative, so how are the individual story beats? Yeah, I really hope you weren't expecting much here. The very first story arc of the game has Lightning trying to find out who's responsible for a series of serial murders. You run around gathering evidence to try and figure out what happened. But who could have done it? Was it the local guard? Maybe the man standing by the station? How about the death cult who wears white hoods and hangs out by the locked graveyard chanting death to the non-believers? That's a real head scratcher, that one. If you're thinking I might be cherry picking here, let me emphasize that this is the very first plot thread in the game. This was their opening arc meant to hook the player in. A murder mystery you can solve yourself in like, 30 seconds. The rest of the plot thread is just dragging lightning along for the ride. And I can't say the quality of the writing gets much better from this point on. The thing about a bad plot is that it can be carried by standout characters, and I really wish I didn't have to keep starting these sentences only to end them with, but lightning returns cocks it. First off, our protagonist Lightning, it's the third game, you know her, you're familiar with her. In Final Fantasy XIII, Lightning was criticized for being a quote, tough protagonist without any real emotional depth. In my opinion, I think a lot of that can be blamed on the voice direction the localization director gave to her voice actor, Ali Hillis, but that's neither here nor there. I think Lightning was a good character in XIII. Maybe you think so too, maybe you don't, but the facts are people were split. You know what they did about that for Lightning Returns? They removed her emotions entirely. Like, am I living in the shitpost dimension? People were complaining about this character being stoic and boring. How is the response to that, whatever, just throw the whole personality out? There are plot reasons for this in-game, but couldn't the story have been written so as not to remove the character from the main character? It's not even a plot point you'd have to tweak that much. Look, ain't no one listening to this? When I awoke from my dreamless sleep, I was just in time to witness the end of the world. And thinking, man, am I excited to spend the next 30 hours with this character? It's not as bad in Japanese. She basically sounds the same while she goes around telling people she has no emotions, but I just don't get the reasoning behind the decision to unplug the personality of the protagonist from the game that only has one protagonist. I am literally staring at a quote from the producer Yoshinori Kitase where he says that Lightning's stoicness in 13 may have alienated players. 
And yet, in response to that, they do this. I just- I, I cannot will myself to understand this decision. As for the other characters, Lightning Returns is kind of like an All-Stars reunion for every character that's shown up in the 13 series so far. I don't think there's a single main character from those games that doesn't appear in this one. I mentioned that there's five main quests, and each one has to do with a character from 13's past. The thing is, these characters are usually pretty weak and underdeveloped. At most, there's a brief problem Lightning solves, and then they get put in the refrigerator until the ending cutscene. None of them undergo any type of significant character development from the beginning to the end of their arcs. It's not that the game doesn't try to tackle interesting themes. It takes place in a world where time has basically been stopped for 500 years. It does at least attempt to make a plot point out of what that can do to someone mentally, but it just doesn't end up going anywhere. I can't help but think that this theme has been done better somewhere else. That one's free. Re-release this game, Sakaguchi, or so help me. The character who gets the most development is probably Snow, but in the entire chapter about him, he only shows up in a handful of cutscenes. He starts off being a reluctant antagonist, ruling over Yusnan as the literal king of parties because he's got that wife dead depression. He later turns into a Seath, which, in case you forgot, and I wouldn't blame you if you did, is the in-game term for a Lassie who fails her focus and becomes a zombie. After a boss fight with him, he becomes your ally, which actually means he's gonna sit in this room and have absolutely zero impact on the rest of the game until his cameo appearance in the last 20 minutes. Overall, I think the worst part is that these characters don't feel like the same ones from Final Fantasy XIII. They have the same names and share the same models because Square Enix was on a tight budget, but the setting they're in is so vastly different, there's like this disconnect in my brain. They feel like how guest characters are treated in crossover games, if you get what I mean. Thematically, Lightning Returns doesn't feel related to 13 in any way. It kinda does to 13 too, but even then, that's a stretch. I feel like 13 was internally consistent with its own universe. It had magic and fantastical elements, sure, but it was a self-contained plot with a beginning and an end. Everything all sorta of made sense in a way. Meanwhile in Lightning Returns, it feels like everything's gone off the rails. Anything goes, and you just have to go along with it. The plot almost feels deliberately confusing. This may have to do with the fact, and I can't believe we're here again, the localization for Lightning Returns was completely fumbled. 13 had a mess of a localization, so bad that it was one of the specific issues they wanted to iron out for 13 too. That being the case, how exactly did we end up in the same situation for Lightning Returns? Localizations mean a lot to me, but this isn't me being picky or anything. It was bad enough that a group of people got together to create a Lightning Returns retranslation project. Again, I understand localization is a massive effort that requires a ton of work from a ton of people. I'm not trying to undersell the work they put in. When localization is done right, it's almost an invisible process. It's just when things are off, it really starts to fall apart quick. There are little things. Lightning's title in English is The Savior, while in Japanese it's Liberator. Small thing that doesn't really matter, sure, but for the English Steam trading card, Lightning's title is Liberator. Raises a few eyebrows. Maybe it was supposed to be Liberator all along, but something, air quotes, happened. Then you have big things, like multiple different concepts that were all translated to the same thing in English, which is bound to cause a few hiccups here and there. One example is the Japanese words Shinzo, Kokoro, and Tamashi were all universally translated to heart in English. These aren't only literally different words with different meanings, but they also represent different things entirely in the Lightning Returns universe. I found a blog post that details a lot of these localization issues, so rather than wasting time by going over all of them one by one, I'll just drop a link in the description if you're into this kind of thing. I know I am. For now, just remember this. If you played through Lightning Returns and ended up confused or lost, it's probably not your fault. You were probably done dirty by the localization. But maybe, just maybe, I'm judging Lightning Returns from the wrong angle. I still don't know what this game is meant to be. The developers didn't directly state it, or at least I couldn't find a definitive statement in the research I had done. The most I could find is that they deliberately didn't call it 13.3 because they wanted to emphasize that it was a new experience. So I guess that means it's up to the players to make a judgement call. Is it supposed to be some passion side project spin-off from the 13 team? Or is it supposed to be treated like a mainline Final Fantasy game? It is the third game of the 13 series, the definitive ending to that plotline, so it could be mainline, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like it was made to be. But then again, are sequels to mainline Final Fantasy games mainline Final Fantasy games? Lightning Returns is weird, experimental, and it doesn't really fit with the other games in the series. It doesn't even sit with the rest of the Final Fantasy games in my Steam library, a fact that, yes, does bother me a lot more than it should. I've poured over all this game's development history, and I'm still not sure which of the two the creators meant it to be. But no matter which it is, at the end of the day, does it really matter? 
Should a game be judged differently based on some arbitrary label? I'd say it could be, but there's definitely a limit. I hosted a poll asking everyone whether they considered Lightning Returns a mainline Final Fantasy game or not, and the majority seemed to think that a direct sequel to a mainline game is also mainline. I think I agree with this, but then again, I wouldn't consider Revenant Wings mainline. Is for the After Years mainline? I hope it isn't, I dedicate like an hour a day to pretending that game doesn't exist. Turns out that this is a subject that's more complicated than it looks at first glance, but let's put all those labels and definitions aside. Let's call this what it is. Lightning Returns is a sequel no one really wanted. It was churned out with only a year and a half of work put into it, and it shows. I have no doubt that there were some very talented developers on this team that put their all into making this game as best they could, but that's just not enough time to make a AAA RPG game in a flagship series. Almost every main character model is reused, most of the enemies are reused, the areas are new, but their lack of polish is pretty clear even to the untrained eye. It stretches those four areas over about 35 hours of playtime. They had to have known the reputation that 13 and 13-2 had garnered. It doesn't make sense to me how many cost-cutting measures they used to squeeze out Lightning Returns. This game was made by the main branch of Final Fantasy developers. I completely get that deadlines might have been out of their hands, and they may have been pressured to get a sequel out ASAP. Despite its low sales, it was apparently a success for the company, so if you can squeeze something profitable out by cutting every corner possible, what's the incentive to spend more money and time to try and raise the quality? Obviously, the development team gave it their all, and there's no guarantee that more money would have even made it good. I'm not saying the game was self-sabotaged or that no one on the team cared. I'm just saying it's not surprising to me at all that Lightning Returns ended up as lackluster as it did. There was no part of this development formula that would have resulted in a high-quality game. It's not surprising to me that after this, a lot of people didn't think Final Fantasy could ever be good again. People were sick of 13, sick of the number, sick of lightning. It's no secret why Final Fantasy XV literally sprinted away from any association with the series. They knew marketing that game as another 13 related project wasn't going to go over well. So, this is where the 13 series would come to an end, with a rushed game that barely managed to hit mid-60s on Metacritic. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the ending of the game, so if you're planning on playing it for yourself, skip to this timestamp. But, uh, let's be real, none of this is really all that worth going into unspoiled. Yeah, that feels like a long enough time. So once you finish the five main chapters, you find out that Bunavelza thinks that being dead is kind of cringe, so part of creating the new world is purging the souls of the dead out of existence. He plans on tricking Vanille into doing so by having her use this box called the Holy Clavis. It's called the Sacred Treasure in Japanese, so I don't know why they went all extra with its name in the localization, but whatever. By the way, Vanille's back, and she's being called a saint by the order that worships Bunavelza. Not to be confused with the White Hooded Death Cult from earlier. Her and Fang went through a little breakup, since Fang's not so cool with the whole being a puppet of a cult thing. Vanille seems to have moved on pretty quick though, damn. It turns out that while Lightning has the ability to save living souls and bring them into the new world, Vanille can do the same for the souls of the dead, a fact that's being kept from her. Vanille doesn't know that she can save dead people's souls, she's being manipulated into thinking that she's releasing them from their suffering by destroying them. So, Lightning faces a dilemma. She can let Vanille purge the souls of the dead, but remember, Sarah's dead, and the whole reason Lightning is doing this whole savior thing is because God promised he'd return Sarah to her. A deal that Lightning's starting to realize might have been a deception tactic from the start. Option B is to tell Vanille the truth and stop her from dropping a mixtape so hard it deletes all the dead people, but by doing so, she would directly defy God's wishes, and she kinda needs him to create the new world? Either way, rough choice. Anyways, if you fulfilled all the requirements, you also unlock the secret final day. You see, days in the 13 universe have 26 hours, 13 hours in the AM and the PM. You can actually find references to this around other games, like the clock in the schoolhouse from 13. The thing is, Days and Lightning Returns only have 24 hours. By completing a certain amount of quests, Lightning can reclaim these two lost hours from each day, which gives you a full extra in-game day to do quests and stuff. I wonder if they planned this from the beginning, what with already having the days from the first game taking up 13 hours. Food for thought. If you've been paying attention to what I've been saying, then you probably already know that this is more time I neither want nor need, but it does open up an optional bonus dungeon where you can fight turbocharged enemies on a super boss. Kinda cool, and a nice challenge, but there's just not much to say about it. Optional dungeons are basically an RPG standard, so while I'm glad Lightning Returns has one, I'm not gonna kiss its feet for it. With that extra day out of the way, Lightning ultimately decides to stop the ritual with the help of Snow and Fang, which causes God to show up in Hope's body. 
Now let me tell you, my dude is pissed. Not only does God think that being dead is unclean, he also saw people's attachment to those they lost as defilement he wanted to keep out of the new world. This cutscene is kind of a mess because of the poor localization. It's probably the worst one. Pronouns are all out of whack and the soul heart thing is out in full force, but the gist is that God doesn't know where Sarah is because he can't see souls. I mean, it's not like it would be a masterpiece in storytelling where the localization fixed anyways. Long story short, negotiations break down, God says, you ruined it, Lightning. No one gets a new world now. There's a mildly interesting plot point here about Lightning being planned to replace Etro as the god in the new world, but she ain't having it, so a boss fight starts. What plays out is, honestly, no cap, probably the best final boss fight in the 13 series. I mean, the last two were below average, true, but the boss fight against Buna Velza is honestly pretty good. Which is weird, because the other boss fights in Lightning Returns have probably been the low point of the gameplay so far. It's fast-paced, his moveset is fun to interact with, and it's just overall an enjoyable challenge. Uh, I mean, aside from the final phase, where it's just a puzzle fight where you have to figure out the one specific move that staggers him. It was also here where I was bestowed with the cursed knowledge that the Thundaga spell makes the Star Wars blaster sound effect, so there is that. <laughs> After the boss fight, Lightning intends to sacrifice herself so everyone can make it to the new world, but Lumina appears and reveals herself as Lightning's suppressed feelings and vulnerabilities, as well as safeguarding Sarah's soul. She gives Lightning a helping hand at her lowest. Don't say Lumina never came through. With all that said and done, Lightning calls back the souls of all the major characters from the 13 series, so they can all do a father-son Kamehameha to finish Booney off. Wait, where's Saz? Are they really gonna do him like that again? After 13-2 and everything? Oh, there he is. But why didn't he get to participate in the cool thing, though? Personally, I really like him as a character, but the writers really did shove him in a closet after the first game. Now, I get it. This is supposed to be a big finale where everyone shows up. A big celebration of the entire 13 trilogy, as well as how far the characters and the player has come. I don't just speak for myself, though, when I say the mood in the room is a collective sigh. Afterwards, Caius and the Council of Yules decide to stay behind to keep the balance between the living and the dead in the New World, the same way Etro did in the old one. Noel's kinda pissed at the arrangement because he wanted Yule to live a happy life, but eventually he relents. As a present for being a good boy, Caius allows Noel to have a single Yule as his GF in the New World. I'm happy for him. Now, even if you've never played Lightning Returns before, hell, even if you've never even sniffed a copy of Lightning Returns before, you probably know how this ends. It's just so infamous. Everything fades to white, and then we get a scene of Lightning in the New World, and she's riding a train in real-life rural France. Yeah, the New World Bunavelza created was our world, like... You and me. Does that mean I was a character in Lightning Returns and I just didn't know? Whoa. This is definitely a controversial ending. Actually, I don't know if controversial is the right word. I don't think anyone is genuinely like, ah yes, lightning in the real world, very cool, very pog. People either don't care, think it's stupid, or something in between. Honestly, I just roll my eyes and move on. It is what it is. And this is where it ends. I mean, sort of. There's a novella that goes into interviews with the main characters now that they live in the real world, but I don't have the mental fortitude to tackle that. Now that we've hit credits, let's wrap this up with a big conclusion and then get out of here. It's not too hard to say what I feel about Lightning Returns. It had some ideas that I genuinely ended up enjoying, at least for a little while, and those ideas were so unique, I have to give credit where credit is due. The battle system is also genuinely fun and engaging, with a high skill ceiling that rewards you for mastering it. It's just that the rest of the game is such a mess. I try to find the redeeming points in these games, I really do. I want to evolve critical discussion around the 13 series beyond linear, game bad, and lightning stupid. I think it's a cop-out to just call a game terrible if it has some genuinely good qualities that are worth talking about. Lightning Returns does have some good qualities, but I just don't think it's all that great. 
I had fun in brief moments, but all of that was overshadowed by a bad story in an asset flip game that's half falling apart at the seams. Before playing it, I really wanted it to be one of those so bad it's good kind of games, but instead it just ended up being so bad it's still bad kind of deals. It was a trash fire instead of fire trash. Would I recommend you play Lightning Returns? Probably not. If you're at the point where you're asking that question though, you're probably neck deep in the Final Fantasy XIII series already, so I guess you might as well go all the way. I played this game because, I mean, I had to know. I skipped over it back in the day, and no one really talks about it beyond saying it was one of the worst games in the entire series when it came out. I had to find out for myself, and then I had to share it with everyone else. Now I feel like when you get too much insight in Bloodborne and the knowledge makes you go mad. The eyes on the inside have seen too much, and WikiHow won't tell me how to close them. I'm glad I played Lightning Returns. Honestly, I really am. It was worth it for the experience. For me, at least. Probably won't be for a lot of you. I don't regret playing it, but I definitely get why most people are cool with pretending it doesn't exist. So, with all that said and done, that's the entire Final Fantasy XIII trilogy wrapped up in three neat retrospectives. I didn't think I had it in me to talk about these games for three hours plus. It was definitely a controversial part of Square Enix's history. I guess since I've come this far, I might as well rank the three games. At number one is 13, easily. I think that game has a lot to like, and while a lot of criticism directed towards it is fair, a lot of it was steeped in the climate of the time. 13 is a good game, definitely flawed, but I mean, it wouldn't be very interesting to talk about if it wasn't. I don't think it should be anyone's first Final Fantasy game, but I definitely wouldn't have trouble recommending it to anyone who's played at least five others. Second place is gonna go to 13-2. It's clear the developer's goal for 13-2 was to patch up issues people had with 13. Half of these changes were for the better, but the other half got me with my head in my hands staring at my desk. There is stuff to like here though. It's not incredible or anything, but a really strong villain and an improved battle system carries it along, not to mention the music. That means last place is going to be our protagonist of the day, Lightning Returns. There were points where Lightning Returns was at its best where I genuinely thought it would end up being better than 13 too, but that didn't end up being the case. It's a shame, but hey, it do be that way sometimes. And that's all I have to say about that. What a way to end it off. If you're watching this far in, thanks, and I really mean it. It really means a lot that so many people have supported what is essentially a video series of Old Man Yells at Cloud. The reception to these videos has been insanely positive, and I'm genuinely blown away by it. Thing is, let's just say that this isn't exactly where the Fabula Nova Crystallis series ends, if you catch my drift. What do I mean? Well, hope you'll stick around to see what I mean. But before that, maybe something a little different. Anyways, till next time.